Pregnancy is hard. Labor is hard. I want my pregnant patients exercising because labor is like a very long workout with lots of one rep maxes at the end. And so um, it is very important that they're strong and good cardiorespiratory athleticism there to um, be able to have a good successful labor. What are some of the benefits of doing CrossFit while pregnant? I think that the, the main benefits are no different than any other benefit or the, the main benefits are the same that you would see for any athlete that's training at any point in their life. So doing the movements is going to maintain range of motion. It's going to keep your joints healthy. It's going to keep the athlete uh, moving. It's going to increase their fitness. All those things don't, they're not different when you're pregnant. And so the same benefits that we talk about with athletes who are not pregnant are still going to apply when they are pregnant. I think there are a couple other elements that become more specific when someone is pregnant. One of the ones maybe not specific to training, but that I always like to talk about is that I think that it keeps women involved with the community and a motivating environment and oftentimes around other moms that have already gone through this and been very successful in terms of making it through that whole let's call it 18 month, two year cycle of becoming pregnant, coming back after pregnancy, and then getting back to a state where maybe they, they, they're through that phase. I think that the, a lot of what we see is that once women become pregnant, then they need to go to special classes for people that are pregnant, uh, maybe outside of their community. And a lot of times their community is their biggest asset. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Allison, Are there any risks that we should talk about for pregnant athletes? Um, Let's say that they've they've done CrossFit in the past, newly pregnant. What are the risks of continuing CrossFit? Are there any? There's really very minimal risks. There's a few things that as they get bigger, they're going to have to scale. But really, even the first trimester, I don't tell my pregnant patients or athletes they have to scale much. But as their abdomen, their belly grows... Um, yes, there's, we don't want any trauma to the abdomen. That's the first thing I try to um, emphasize to my pregnant athletes. Um, so things like, you, I let them jump on the ground, but do we want them falling? A fall could be a big risk to a pregnant woman. The jumping itself is not a risk. Um, uh, so I'm excited when my patients come in and they're doing CrossFit or any other type of exercise. We talk about certain limitations as each trimester progresses that they need to be aware of. But overall, CrossFit is very safe for pregnant women. Anything to add, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, I think the benefits of exercise are undisputed. Like Nicole said, anything that's good for you when you're not pregnant is even better for you when you're pregnant because you're literally growing another human. There definitely are physiologic changes that happen in pregnancy that we have to be aware of, like the hormones, progesterone, and relax and start to loosen our ligaments and tendons so athletes can be more prone to injuries and may need different modifications. Um, We know in CrossFit athletes that aren't pregnant, pelvic floor dysfunction is big. So as this baby and this uterus are getting really heavy on the pelvic floor, we need to, you know, touch in with those athletes and figure out what's going on. I'm a huge fan of pelvic floor physical therapy especially in the postpartum period after delivery. So sometimes you do need modifications to protect things that they might be susceptible to coming into pregnancy, but undisputed that continuing exercise in pregnancy reduces risks for a lot of things like excessive weight gain, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia. So huge fan. Really cool. I'm going to ask you the next question. If, uh, if I am an athlete and let's say I'm newly pregnant or I'm thinking about getting pregnant, what are some questions that I should be asking my OBGYN uh, um, well, either prior to getting pregnant or uh, newly pregnant to continue doing CrossFit? Well, there may be things specific to the individual that you want to talk to your obstetrician gynecologist about, but for the vast majority of people, like Allison highlighted, there's really no contraindication to exercise itself. You know, let your, you know, let your doctor know what you're doing for training, let them help you, but I'll be you know, the first to admit there's a lot of you're not going to find Allison and I have a lot of, you know, friends and colleagues that practice just like we do. You, your doctor may not have all of the answers for you. So I love, you know, what Nicole has provided to this CrossFit community. There are people out there that take care of athletes and know how to scale and 
and each trimester is going to be a little bit different, but just maintaining adequate nutrition and especially hydration. If you're training in a hot environment, pregnant women are more susceptible to dehydration. You need more fluids, more electrolytes, especially, you know, as you get towards the end. Really cool. Allison, anything to add to that? Questions from a pregnant athlete? Um, I think it really just depends on where the person is starting from and what their goals are during the pregnancy. Um, you know, sometimes I have people come in and say, can I start CrossFit in a pregnancy? And actually they can. It's just like they're going to start a new program. Um, lab- pregnancy is hard. Labor is hard. I want my pregnant patients exercising because labor is like a very long workout with lots of one rep maxes at the end. And so... Um, it is very important that they're strong and, and have um, uh, good cardiorespiratory athleticism there to um, be able to have a good successful labor. I think that's interesting because I think that's something that would pop up quite a bit is that maybe it is a misconception based off the conversation we're having here is that if you are newly pregnant, you can't start CrossFit. You can only do CrossFit if you were doing CrossFit prior to getting pregnant. What we're hearing here is that's not true. It's just implementing it properly, scaling back, you know, maybe not doing too much too soon. Yeah, that's really cool. That's interesting. Um, Nicole, are there any movements that pregnant athletes should stay away from? And does that change from trimester the trimester. Yeah, so when we look at flexion, uh, the sit-up action, uh, we talked about relaxing being allowing that elasticity or that uh, the, the muscle tendon, the muscles and the tendons to, to go a little bit beyond what they normally would. We want to not challenge that and let that happen naturally. And so some of those movements like a sit-up uh, are something that we want athletes to avoid or pull out of their movement. Uh, basically, once they start seeing that coning motion, and you guys might have um, thoughts on you know when that is, but it's 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 ge- it's generally in that first trimester. You, you kind of like pick your head up and you start to see that it goes into a little cone. It's like okay, we're going to take that out. Um, and so the neat part with CrossFit, and this really applies for so many different specialties, but. The great news is, is that there are a million other ways that we can work to train the core and keep the core stable uh, while that athlete prese- progresses uh, through the trimester. So generally, uh, our recommendation when we are looking at the scaling guide is to once athletes um, are in that first trimester after like the first, you know, eight to 10 weeks, which is usually when they tend to find out, uh, then those sit-ups just come out of that motion the or uh, training plan. The second thing would be kipping motions. And so things like toes to bar, which obviously as they're lifting the legs, that's going to have the flexion, but even that other direction of the forward um, side of the kip, uh, from a foundational standpoint, that's why we want to train a really tight and uh, well-developed kip so that it's not this big swing and arch. But then in addition to that, then we just move to, okay, we have strict variations of that movement that are going to preserve that. So things like GHD sit-ups, toes to bar, uh, sit-ups, those come out. When that, that's the main ones. I don't know if you guys have uh, movements to add uh, to that. Uh, one thing that I tell them, you know, after about 16 to 20 weeks, they really shouldn't be laying on their back for a prolonged time, no matter what exercise. Um, they can be um, like on an incline bench or something like that. Um, we talk about in the Olympic lifting um, movements, you know, as they grow, their abdomen's going to maybe change their bar path so that can put more strain on their back or... We don't, obviously don't want them hitting their abdomen. So a lot of people will change to dumbbells for a lot of those movements. Um, you know, like box jumps. I recommend going to box step-ups because I just don't want them to fall. Um, so those kind of things. Yeah, and I think that the, 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 there's an element there too where I think a lot of times it becomes a very natural an obvious choice for women. Um, if you've ever tried to move a barbell around your, your stomach, it's, it's not your ideal moving pattern. And all of a sudden, dumbbells feel like a really good option. Um, so I think there's, there's a second category with those movements where there is a, a safety element that becomes very obvious to the athlete uh, as well as a comfort level. And you can just promote those. And it's usually just scaling back one version uh, of the movement. 
yeah, I love these modifications. And the other one, sometimes running can be really difficult in the third trimester, especially on the pelvic floor. So you can always go to the rowing machine. You can go to bike sprints. You can do other forms that can still get that sprint aerobic capacity. The other one, too, is like deadlifting. And so, you know, going, being able to have options like sumo deadlifting so that you can navigate the stomach in a way that doesn't uh, make it uncomfortable to, to fold over the bar. Really cool. What about, so we've talked a lot about movements, scaling movements. While pregnant, what about intensity? Well, how does intensity fit in? You know, what is the right intensity? Does that change from trimester to trimester? I would say, I tell most of my pregnant people, there's no like recommended heart rate um, that the max elevation anymore, but you really just have to listen to your body. Um, you know, it's going to be relative to the person. You can see somebody who is an elite athlete, they're going to be able to do things and be fine with the pregnancy and people are going to look at them and be amazed and say that they're not supposed to be doing those things, but they were in such good shape before that it's really not much of a change for them versus somebody who's just starting. So it, it is relative to the person. It doesn't, the pregnancy just adds one more layer in there. So it is, I do tell my pregnant CrossFitters, it's going to be harder. You're not going to be as fast. You're going to be breathing harder. You do have to worry about if it's hot, staying cool and staying hydrated. Yeah, the recommendations in pregnancy were very antiquated for a long time. And some patients will even come to me saying that their previous doctor said, don't go over 140 or don't go above 80% of max. These are extremely arbitrary recommendations that were pulled out of thin air. It wasn't based on evidence because it's really hard to study pregnant patients because there's no, you know, we'd have to be very invasive to be able to monitor, you know, fetal heart tones and things like that. And they have done studies where they have you know, hooked a mom up to a monitor, had her do a workout, did a non-stress test afterwards, you know, looked at these things, but we just don't have a good way to study that. So I totally agree with Allison. There's really no upper limit that we know of. With that said, the physiologic changes women will notice and experience is that if you're wearing a heart rate monitor, your heart rate is going to go up quicker. You're going to get short of breath quicker. There's these physiologic changes in your blood volume and the way that your lungs can fill and respirate that are, that are going to change. And you're going to have to work with the individual athlete or kind of know your own body to, to kind of where you probably need to scale back. You know, not everybody is in the shape that T is in coming into a pregnancy. Some people might, you know, be at a different place in their health journey and you may make those, you know, adaptations, but you're right, Allison, I totally agree. You can, you can push the upper limits for sure. Yeah, I think this is uh, probably where maybe a lot of women get a little bit, uh, you know, we have strong thoughts. I, because uh, the internet can be somewhat, you know, not kind at times. But I, I think the relative intensity point, when you look at CrossFit and our methodology, yes, absolute intensity is what we're looking for in the big picture in terms of what's your fran time and how much can you deadlift. But then we've got this added layer of relative intensity that makes CrossFit accessible to every single athlete out there. And so there are there is that extra factor, which is the athlete is pregnant. But starting point is so incredibly important. And women, whether they're pregnant or not, men, whether they're you know, coming back from an injury or not, relative intensity is there whether you know it or not. And so, yes, listening to your body is such an important thing. Um, but, but the starting point just has to be something that for coaches that you're taking into consideration. And so even the old stuff of like, you know, you should never get to a point where you can't have a conversation and things like that, like, right. It's so antiquated. Um, and, 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 and so what are you looking at? Is the athlete moving well? Are they moving safely? Are, and when I say safely, I don't mean for a pregnant athlete. I mean the same thing you would be doing for any athlete that walks into your gym. Um, and then, and then from there, uh, you know, looking at how does that apply to what you know in advance, an athlete that comes in and does a Fran that's pregnant in five minutes and you're like, oh my God, that is, that is not okay. Well, relative intensity, if their time when they're not pregnant is two minutes, that's more than 50% slower. And so we have to start with the athlete that we're looking at to be able to apply relative intensity and make it honestly make sure that the athlete gets the, the good stuff out of the training that they are doing while they're pregnant rather than having these arbitrary limitations. Only study that I've ever heard of where they showed that 
there were changes in the fetal heart rate were marathon runners. And these were elite marathon runners who were running for like three to four hours at a very fast pace. And they monitored the heart rate um, for that long. And they showed slight changes after three and a half hours of running. Um, but that was, and then it resolved as soon as they stopped. So really, I mean, rarely you see pregnant women exercising for that long, but, um, and that was at a continuous pace. But that's the only study I've ever sh seen that showed any changes to the baby. And it was very short lived. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I tell my CrossFit athletes and my athlete patients, you know, this isn't the time to PR, but we're going to continue to do what we can, you know, throughout the pregnancy because we know there's benefits through the pregnancy and beyond. Um, but it, like you said, there's, like I said, there's no good way that we can test that's not invasive to these athletes. There was one gal who was a U.S., I uh, believe she was a bike sprinter, but they did hook up a fetal scalp electrode during her labor and they let, they monitored the baby throughout her labor and they really saw no abnormalities. I think maybe the one looming question in the literature is probably the difference between what we call aerobic and anaerobic. So, you know, CrossFit athletes probably do get into that anaerobic space and because of the physiologic changes, a pregnant woman can't breathe off that metabolic acidosis quickly, but I find it's really self-limiting. You know, if, a preg if my pregnant patient starts to feel lightheaded, dizzy, something doesn't feel right, then we scale back a little bit. But I find that most pe people aren't going aren't gonna to push past that limit. Yeah. And I, I, the last thing there is when we look at the physical and psychological tolerances, right? <laughs> when, when we look at relative intensity, we've got two factors. We've got physical and psychological tolerance. So your physical tolerance is obviously going to be pulled back be by the nature of being pregnant. But I'm going to give women, like, let's give women a lot of credit that on the psychological tolerance, there is a layer that they are paying attention to at every single point in that pregnancy. As a coach, I've never had a woman come to me as a pregnant athlete and say, you know what, I'm pregnant. I'm actually going to try and burn it down every workout for the next nine months. And so the, the psychological tolerance, it, it's, it's human nature. It's built into what we're doing when we're training on an everyday basis. And uh, yeah. Moms are smart. Maternal instinct is Weird. real. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Well answered. Thank you. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the coach. Let's say I'm a coach and um, I have a, a newly pregnant athlete come in. How can I set up a very you know, just safe and supportive environment for, for this athlete? What are, what, are the, what are the things I need to know about training a pregnant athlete? And, and anyone can take this one. I mean, I would just make sure she's talked to her doctor to make about that she does this exercise program and, and the nutrition, what she's eating, um, to make sure that all of that is adequate for the pregnancy, um, because it is going to vary between people. There are a few pregnancy things where I, I do recommend that they can't exercise, but it's not usually till later in the pregnancy, and usually their doctor is going to have said, you know, we're going to have to pull back at this point, or you're having this complication of pregnancy, so... But it really just, again, depends on um, the person we're talking to. But I would just make sure as a coach, you've made sure they've discussed it with their physician um, so they have this plan laid out. Yeah, I, I think from the affiliate perspective, there's so much that you can do to support that initial transition. So just a couple ideas there is... Uh, well, once someone emails us uh, that they're pregnant, it's sort of a joke that, you know, once they tell their husband, we're usually the first ones to know. Uh, so that's always kind of funny to me. But uh, setting up a, a meeting with that athlete. So we'll usually print out the scaling guide. We'll print out, uh, send them a list of resources that they can look through. Um, and in that meeting, we're basically talking about really what the goals are for that first trimester, why those movements are coming out, always recommending that obviously they've talked to their doctor and that they can continue exercising and then that that's a good idea. Uh, and then the other thing that we'll do oftentimes, or two things, would be one, just like when you scale for somebody or modify for somebody that has an injury, the job of the coach is to help continue that trust of the athlete knowing that when they show up each day, they're going to get taken care of and they're not going to be a burden to the coach. And so you can build that in by saying, hey, here are the next two weeks of workouts. This is how we would approach them for you. This is what, this is what we're going to do. And so then they know that you have a plan. And then the other one is we'll always connect them. They know, you know, most of the pregnant people when they come and they have friends in the gym, but we'll always connect them with a, a go-to mom that's recently went through it. So they just have somebody that they can talk to for questions. 
uh, maybe if they don't want to ask one of the male coaches or things like that, or if the, one of the women coaches isn't there that day. So there's a lot of stuff I think you can do on the front end to really just like assimilate them and like, this is totally normal. This is what we do. Yeah, I love that. Just like we ask for open, honest communication with our patients, the same thing with your, you know, affiliate coaches and your trainers, just that open, honest, hey, this is how I'm feeling. And that, you know, they'll be able to implement those changes when you need them or if you need them. Off the top of your head, I mean, you said some resources. What are some really good resources that we can provide the crowd now? Like where can they go to just get quick resources that they could hand off to an athlete uh, in, in the affiliate? From a CrossFit specific perspective, we've got um, two, two articles, one on training with pregnancy and then a scaling guide to pregnancy. So, you know, we talk about like if rowing's not comfortable and for some people they're like, I love rowing. And some people they're like, I hate rowing when I'm pregnant. Uh, so whether it's pulling a sled or using the ski erg, so lots of options there. And there's also been a number of podcasts that CrossFit has done over the years that are great resources. And those are all from, the, from our CrossFit content side. Yeah, the American College of OBGYNs has some recommendations in pregnancy, but like I said, I think they're still pretty antiquated, so I don't know if it's the best resource. I think CrossFit has provided athletes with a lot of really good information, and I love that, hooking in with the community, people that have been through this before, and, and that's, these days, social media is amazing for that reason. Okay, so we've talked a lot about movement. What are some other conversations that coaches should be having with pregnant athletes outside of movement? Well, I just thought of, of one with the, with the article stuff that maybe goes into this category a little bit, but uh, you also have to give all that content to your coaches, especially your 25-year-old male coaches. And, and what I mean, that, I mean this in a nice way, in the sense that you need to prep everybody involved. And so I know that I missed that the first time that, uh, or the second time I had a kid, it was just sort of like obvious to me how you'd be doing it. And I, I sort of looked over the fact that maybe for a 23-year-old male coach, it might not be the most thing they're read, in, you know, something they're read in on. And so all those resources, everything we're talking about, that needs to be like a staff meeting so that they feel confident. And what I think is super cool is when you have like a 35-year-old woman come and be like, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so coach who's your, you know, young male coach, like, oh, he was great and he knew all this stuff. And, and like right there, you've just... You've just set them up for success for way beyond nine months. So just let all those resources be like a team effort. I think one thing that I experienced going through my first pregnancy was just this loss of identity when you have this new baby. So I think, you know, you know, exercise is great. And we've talked about all the amazing benefits, but just checking in with these moms, you know, we know postpartum depression is real, even amongst people that work out and take care of themselves. So just really checking in on these new moms and the new hurdles that they're going to have, you know, with this new life. But you know, the CrossFit community, that's what they do. They do a really good job at that. Should we be talking to them uh, about these other aspects of health, right? So nutrition, sleep, those types of things. Are those conversations that coaches should be having with these athletes? I think should and well. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't actually know a mom that comes back to the gym and I say, how are you doing? And she's like, oh, I'm really well rested and I'm getting all the sleep I want. So I think a lot of those conversations come out naturally. And so on the sleep thing, I think the biggest thing that we can do as coaches and just knowing how other moms have done it is to be able to have three ideas. So like one of the ones I always give the moms is they're like, well, I'm, I'm having a really hard time getting in two days a week and, or, you know, even three days a week because then I lose sleep and we're trading off. And I'm like, well, what if on Saturday, you know, you bring the baby or your husband has, brings the baby to the gym for the 8 a.m. class and then you guys just switch out. So yes. For a small period of your life, you're going to take two hours for you and your husband to work out. But it's little things like that that I think help connect them back to the gym and give them solutions to things like sleep. Because I think simply just saying, hey, you should be getting eight hours of sleep is kind of rude. <laughs> just get eight hours. It's not going to happen. It's that easy. <laughs> what about nutrition? Nutrition's, um, I remember when we were having kids, like nutrition was a pretty hot topic for pregnant athletes. Um, could they go low carb? Should they go low carb? Could they do whole foods diets? Do they need to have different uh, supplements, certain amounts of vitamins and minerals? Like what is, how does nutrition play a role in the pregnant athlete's experience? Nutrition is, um, is important. You know, when I first started CrossFit, paleo, the paleo diet was like a big deal. That was a long time ago. And that is not recommended in pregnancy, actually. The paleo diet is not recommended. I can think um, they've recently come out and said 
for pregnant women, the healthiest way of eating is the Mediterranean diet, which is very high in like, um, it's whole foods essentially. You're eating whole foods, really trying to avoid processed foods, sugar, and ultra processed foods is what they've really come out most recently saying um, as far as the uh, OBGYN community. Yeah, we used to think of pregnancy as just like eating for two, and that's really not the case. The caloric requirements in pregnancy do go up slightly through each trimester, but the nutrient requirements is what is so important. So just like Allison said, it's whole foods, it's nutrient-dense foods, it's nutrient-dense animal foods. So fish and beef and chicken and dairy and things like that are going to provide you those nutrients um, and not foods that contain a lot of calories with minimal nutrients, which are processed foods, which hopefully the athlete's already, you know, eating a clean diet. But if they're not, this is the time to start focusing on that because we know that there are literally bi-directional epigenetic changes to your baby that kind of set the tone for your baby's health long term. So now is the time to really focus on cleaning up the diet as much as possible and getting nutrients. Yeah, I think it's cool that you can, we, 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 it's so neat how so much we do in CrossFit if we're doing it right for our athletes applies to them throughout their life. And so it, when that athlete comes in and we've seen it, right? The athlete comes in, they're just out of college and you help them transition their nutrition into something that resembles more like the long-term health and not like a college dorm room. Um, you're, you have to think like you're helping them have a better pregnancy down the road. And so there's it, the nutrition piece falls into place uh, long before, you know, they're actually pregnant. Now, if th that's, that's obviously there's added effort there. Um, when they're pregnant. But I think the two things to keep in mind to be compassionate, which I know when I had my first pregnancy, maybe I was less so. But, you know, I've had, you, you can have athletes that eat super clean and they'll be like, well, I, I had a great pregnancy. I, I, I didn't have any nausea and it's because I ate super clean. And then you'll have another athlete that'll eat super clean. They're like, I vomit every morning. And so we have to get beyond this idea that like it's, it's only food related for how we feel in that beginning time. And I think we can all do each other a, a service in that um, and giving ourselves a little bit of leeway there to understand like there are a lot of factors. Obviously, we know that eating real whole unprocessed foods are going to be the best bet whether you're pregnant or not. Uh, but I think that'll help just generally. Yeah, you bring up such a great point. The first trimester can be really brutal for some patients, and it's not because they're not doing something right in their lifestyle. They can have food aversions. They can have nausea that makes it difficult to take down anything. Um, so something they want to talk to their doctor about. A prenatal vitamin, you know, we recommend it to all pregnant patients, but it's really like an insurance policy. The bioavailability of those nutrients from the food are more important. So sometimes supplementation in the first trimester, you know, whether it's additional protein just through a shake or something like that, whatever they can stomach, sometimes you have to be a little bit creative, but the more that they can eat those whole foods, but you're exactly right. What about post-pregnancy? And, and not for nutrition, for movement. So pregnancy's over, they're, they're trying to get back into the gym and create a, a regular workout routine again. How do we ensure that the recovery is done properly to avoid any long-term, uh, maybe pelvic floor issues or, or any other type of issue that can be related to pregnancy? Um, so, a lot of people think it depends on the type of delivery they had. I don't really believe that. I think it, again, depends on the person. I really recommend to my um, pregnant patients, it's very l low impact, you know, and also you, it depends on how much sleep they're getting again. But I do encourage movement. I want them to walk. I want them to get outside because all that, all those things and be around people because that does, I think, help prevent some of those postpartum depression issues. Um, because pregnant women can feel very isolated if they're not, if, because sometimes a lot of, they'll be told to stay in because it's, you know, they don't want their baby to get sick or something, but that can be very isolating, especially if they don't have a lot of help with the baby. So um, I encourage movement, I encourage community. I do recommend sticking with low impact things, non-weighted exercise, really for the first six weeks. Yeah, I totally agree with what you said. You know, if you had a C-section for some reason, obviously you want clearance from your doctor before you start increasing, you know, especially weight resistance, but you can still walk. And I love that um, postpartum blues is a real thing. Maybe it's not depression, but postpartum women sometimes feel very isolated. You've gone from going out with your normal schedule and now you're sitting in the house all alone and your husband's back to work and it can feel really, really, really isolating. So, you know, even just opening it up to that athlete, hey, 
If you want to come walk around the gym with your baby for a couple weeks until you like feel like you're ready, that's amazing. Um, we've said the pelvic floor a few times. I try to get my patients back in with the pelvic floor physical therapist immediately to start cre correcting the diastasis recti, to start strengthening the pelvic floor so that they can start to scale those movements when they feel ready. But if you had a vaginal delivery, there's not an arbitrary time that you have to take off. Um, you know, we know some CrossFit athletes are back in the gym right away. I know with my third baby, I felt like I had everything under control and I was back in seven days later, you know, leaking milk and practically peeing my pants. But that's, I mean, these are the real things that these women are dealing with. And uh, we just want to rehab them and recover them back to their strong, amazing self. And I, and I think the uh, setting some expectations generally that, you know, it took you nine months to get there. Uh, I like to say to athletes, it's going to take you nine months to get fully out of it. And it's not to say that you can't come back seven days or 12 days or six weeks or, you know, whatever it is. It's just, it, it's not that whenever you do come back, you're back. And so I think setting some expectations. The other thing too is uh, generally we, we don't recommend that they're doing sit-ups and things like that until the, the abdominals are fully uh, back together. And so we, we pull those out for the four to six months uh, postpartum. And then honestly, we found that we just uh, ask them to, you know, get the okay from their doctor that that's uh, that, that process has been completed. Um, I just read an article recently that came out that was about women in the military and they did um, their military testing after the pregnancy and they did show the core is the slowest thing to come back to normal. Their upper body strength was, was still there and um, had minimal effect from the pregnancy, but their core, it took months compared to the rest of their body. Yeah, I think there's a misconception when you get diastasis recti, which is a separating of the rectus abdominal muscles, so the ones that go from the top to bottom, that you can just sit on the floor and do crunches and that that will somehow correct that. It's actually the obliques, the transverse abdominis, that need strengthen to pull that back to the midline. So instead of, you know, doing GHD or doing sit-ups or whatever it is, doing plank exercises, doing things that can start to strengthen those sides of the abdominal wall, um, it does, it takes a long time for it to recover. Does it make sense for a pregnant athlete to actually connect their coach to their healthcare professional for like communication that goes both ways? Is that a, is that worthwhile or not necessary? And we certainly have rules we have to play by called HIPAA. So certainly a patient could sign a waiver that we're allowed to discuss it with any person of their, you know, training team or somebody else in their family. But most of the communication is going to, you know, come from the patient. But hey, if a patient asked me to call their trainer, I would have no issue doing it with permission. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, let's get some questions from the crowd. Oh, we got one really quick. Hello. Thank you, ladies. Um, I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist, so thank you for all the shout outs there. Um, some of my patients have been experiencing some contractions that have been deemed not Braxton Hicks. Their cervix is fine. Their doctors have just said, you just have early contractions and we'll just wait and see. Um, any recommendation for activity levels or exercise when my patients are experiencing this? So the question was about people who are experiencing contractions during the pregnancy and when to be concerned. So obviously that is something we want to be aware of as your doctor if you're experiencing that during your workouts. With that said... Anything that increases things like, you know, norepinephrine and adrenaline and these, these types of things will sometimes cause contractions. So just with physical activity in the third trimester, patients may start to experience that tightening, uh, you know, of the, of the uterus. Some patients don't even know it's happening, but it is something to, you know, make your doctor aware of if there is some sort of risk. But for the vast majority of people, dehydration can also cause contractions because you start to secrete another hormone from the, from the pituitary gland. So let your doctor know most of the time if it's not going to be of concern. And generally I tell patients, if you rest and hydrate and it stops and goes away, then everything's probably fine. But check in with your doctor because there are some times where there could be an issue. And so mostly you can keep exercising, but monitor those contractions and those symptoms, still drink plenty of water, and you can still exercise like the next day. It's not like you have to stop or be on bed rest like my patients have been told. You know, bed rest is a really bad idea for the vast majority of patients. Even, you know, patients Allison would know with like preeclampsia, we used to just tell them to lay in a bed and we thought that that would somehow help. It was actually very detrimental. They lose lean body mass very rapidly because of the catabolic state of pregnancy. So bed rest is not recommended, but sometimes it may just be, you know, walking instead of running, but touch base with your doctor because with the contractions, there's just no way to know what's going on, you know, when you're at home or in the gym. 
I have a quick question, just based off what you just said. Um, the catabolic state of pregnancy, does that, would that require an increase in protein intake throughout pregnancy? Yeah, so the first part of pregnancy is very anabolic, actually. And then once you get into the late pregnancy, it's very catabolic. The body is breaking down glucose, fat substrates, making sure there's a continuous supply of fuel to this growing baby. So you do need extra nutrition. But like I said, it's protein, fat, and, and a lot of these micronutrients. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, most of the calories, especially I tell people at 20 weeks, you definitely need, at that point, you should have increased your caloric intake by 300 um, calories. And most of that should be coming from protein. I saw a question over here. Where is it? We'll make it down. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, fellow OB here, Southern Indiana. Thanks for talking on this. Um, we talked a lot about pretty much everything, but one thing we haven't hit on is supplements and things like that. A lot of athletes have questions on what supplements they can continue and things like that. So I just want to get your uh, opinion on that. I had a lot of people recently ask about creatine specifically. And I think there's pretty good research on some of the benefits in pregnancy, actually. So I just want to get your take on some of the supplements and things like that um, and, and what you're seeing and, and kind of what you continue, what you tell them definitely to stop, things like that. Um, supplements can be a little tricky because, you know, there are studies showing that in some of the supplements, it doesn't actually have what it says it has in it. So that's the first thing I tell people they need to be really careful of. So I try to go tell them to go through the NSF, if, you know, just like you're a professional athlete, so we know really what's in that supplement. Um, I, of course, recommend herbal, pro a lot of things that have herbal things in it we need to avoid. Um, protein supplements are okay. I don't know that much about creatine. Um, I, I don't under know why it would be detrimental, but um, especially for people who don't eat meat, um, I have a fair amount of those too. So, um, but I just want them to make sure we're taking, using supplements that we know what's in it. Um, there's not a lot of data in supplements. It's about supplements in pregnancy. So I, I do recommend sometimes collagen. I've had some issues where the babies are huge. And I'm like, what do we do different this pregnancy? And she took, I took collagen every day. And I'm like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Anyway, so. Well, it's an interesting thing, though, is because stretch marks, they think maybe because glycine becomes conditionally essential in pregnancy, it's not an essential amino acid outside of pregnancy, but in pregnancy, it actually becomes conditionally essential. So for that reason, you may argue for collagen supplementation, but um, I agree with the supplements. You have to be really cautious. I honestly tell women to stop all supplements if we, if we don't know what's in it. Um, protein sometimes. Another one I love is fish oil or omega-3s if they're not getting them in the diet. And then vitamin D is another one that sometimes pregnant women tend to be very deficient, especially in Nebraska, where we don't have a lot of great sunlight, especially in the winter months. But the vast majority should be coming from their food. So I work as a midwife, and what I see most often, everybody in my area knows. I'm the midwife. I do CrossFit. But there are some OBGYNs in the area that are very antiquated. So my question would be, how would you tackle that? You're not their provider, but they're asking you for those recommendations that are going against their provider's recommendations. So, like, I can't give them my official... Yeah, yeah. So the question was about midwives and OBGYNs, and if you're working with a provider that's still kind of going off this antiquated advice... First of all, I tell this to my non-pregnant patients, you don't need your doctor's permission to work out and eat healthy. I mean, that's really honestly the, the brutal answer. Um, with that being said, as providers, we're very open-minded most of the time. So sometimes providing your provider with education, hey, I found this, can you take a look at it? Because I think that this might be helpful you know, for me. And, and just having that open, honest communication, you never wanna be with a provider that you don't trust. So I have uh, four midwives in my practice and we co-manage a lot of patients that sometimes need additional monitoring or something like that, but find a provider that you can trust. Hi, my name is Anthony. Thank you very much for everything that you've been doing. Um, I had a few questions, but the first, the first one really is with respect to um, indications. I'm a, I'm a PT, a non-internal pelvic PT, and what would your indications be for sending to for an internal check and also your thoughts on a regular check-in with an internal PT so that they can assess, especially in those first 12 months postpartum? Um, well, when I see a postpartum patient at their vet, 
their few visits postpartum, I always assess their pelvic floor. And it, amazingly, some women, their pelvic floor is very strong postpartum. I, I, you know, I, don't, I think it's really just genetics um, versus sometimes people, you ask them to do something called a Kegel. That's where they're squeezing their pelvic floor and there's no movement. Those people need to go see a pelvic floor PT because they're at risk for pelvic organ prolapse and incontinence and um, later in life if they don't have it already. So I think it's something that most doctors are assessing at those postpartum visits. Um, and I would say a large majority of women do need that pelvic floor physical therapy, but not all of them. I actually like to initiate pelvic PT in pregnancy because I think sometimes getting an assessment, I've actually taken care of a handful of uh, CrossFit athletes that their pelvic floor is so strong. It's so tight that they don't understand how to relax it. Yeah, because they're so used to Valsalva and like doing a deadlift, right? And when you have a baby, you need to actually relax your pelvic floor. So I usually initiate it in pregnancy. Then they've already established that relationship. That way postpartum when they're just so susceptible and, and vulnerable that it's a great you know time to check back in with them right away. You don't have to wait a certain amount of time postpartum to go back and see a pelvic PT, even if it's internal. Just a really quick follow-up question. Number one, I want to talk to you afterwards about diastasis and some of the myths about it, but um, how do you help your clients determine the difference between a Valsalva, which is a squeeze, lift, pressurized support versus a bearing down? Because people actually don't know the difference, even in the research. Yeah, I don't know if I, yeah. So, I mean, yes, you can engage your pelvic floor and your core at the same time without creating a valsalva, which is typically full lung expansion and downward pressure of the diaphragm, like you're trying to push a baby out. But I think a lot of it is just that biofeedback for people even understanding how to engage those muscles and how to control them. It's a neurological, you know. You got anything, Allison? And I think that that's something that, from a coaching perspective, you're going to have to do even independent of an athlete being pregnant. So I think some of the same techniques of being able to understand, you know, what does it look like to bear down? What does it look like to take a breath? What does bracing look like? The more that you can do that on the front end, whether the athlete is going to become pregnant or not, then it just helps them understand those different components and how to apply them in the right time when they are having a baby versus when they're coming back. Thanks very much. Would love to chat to you afterwards. First of all, what's your name and what's the name of your practice? No, <laughs> Jamie Seaman. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska, but I do have a social media, Dr. Fit and Fabulous, D-O-C-T-O-R, if you guys want to follow. What's the name of your practice? Oh, Mid-City OBGYN. Oh, Are you from yeah. Nebraska? Yeah. All right. Two locations. All right. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Research-wise, you said ACOG doesn't have a whole lot of research. Where do you get your research from? I mean, ACOG does have some. I mean, you can go to PubMed, but I'll tell you, there's just... Research in pregnancy is hard because ethically we can't do randomized control trials on pregnant patients, but you know, CrossFit, I know I saw Nicole's article from a number of years ago. It's, it's really good stuff and it is you know, it's as much science backed as it can be. Where do you get that from? So are you, in terms of the scaling elements? No, where do you get your, where do you get your research from? What do you? <sighs> well, kind of the same thing that Jamie was saying in that there's not a lot it's hard to study pregnant women for obvious reasons. Um, and so I'll be honest, with the scaling document for CrossFit, we started with the same principles that we would apply for any other athlete. And then given those parameters about eliminating flexion, some of the considerations with fall risks and things like that, and that really molded the scaling and the modification guide uh, for guiding athletes through the actual training application um, in terms of how you're applying those movements. So if I go to my doctor and I say there's this evidence saying that this is safe and effective for pregnant women. Where do I go? Your site? There are, or? yeah, so there are resource, there are, you know, references listed in that article. So you could refer back to that. But I, I think it, it falls into a, three main categories. Like, is it safe? Is it comfortable? <laughs> when we're looking at movements, not that, you know, when we're looking at the application movements, is it safe? Which should be something that as coaches we're applying no matter what. So the, the same eye that's going to look for a good flat back and a deadlift, we should still be expecting that to our pregnant athletes. And so if that number that they're deadlifting goes down because that's what they need to do to be able to maintain that per point of performance, so that principle is going to apply whether it's an injured athlete, 
a pregnant athlete, because pregnant athletes are not injured, just so we're all clear. Uh, injured athlete, pregnant athlete, athlete that, you know, lost a lung in a car accident. It's all the same principle. And then we're just filtering through, are they moving well and are they moving safe with those extra elements of the fall risk and things like that. Thank you. Sorry. There is an IOC document that talks about elite athletes and pregnancy as well. So it'll be worth looking that up. So the International Olympic Committee. We gotta close, right? We're gonna, we'll have to bring them over there. So we're gonna close this down, but what we'll do is we'll spend 15 minutes or so right by the health booth. If you have any extra questions, come up and ask. Uh, but we gotta get ready for the next, next thing. So we're gonna close this down. Can you please give a round of applause to these wonderful panelists right here? Thank you all so much for being in the crowd and the questions are wonderful. And um, yeah, looking forward to the rest of a good weekend. So thank you so much.